Okay, nobody move. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, glad you're here. Glad, glad you all uh, survived this week. It uh, was an unusual week for San Antonio. That's why we live here, right? Um, and because it's the most awesome city in the world. But other than that, um, uh, yeah, if you had any major issues uh, that you need help with, please let us know if you need financial resources, uh, if you just need people to come to your house to, to help you, you know, fix broken pipes or whatever, let, it, let us know. We'll try to get resources your way to help. Um, we have people who have various gifts in the church who could help with things, and uh, we also have money. If, if you just need money to have someone come fix something, let us know. We'll, we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, yeah, enough about the weather, right? Um, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians, if you would. Uh, this morning we're studying in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Galatians is about 90%, a little more than 90% of the way through your Bible. If you're using a church Bible, you'll find this on page 973. Page 973, it's again, it's Galatians chapter 3. If you find the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just keep going. You have Acts and Romans and First and Second Corinthians, and those are all big books. And so if you keep going at that pace, you're going to pass Galatians. It's tucked in right after, um, right after Second Corinthians. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Verse 4, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham the man of faith. Let's pray together. God, our Father, we do praise you. And we praise you for your sovereign majesty. And we praise you for your grace in bringing us through this storm. Uh, we thank you that uh, you have preserved us and protected us. And we ask uh, for those who have suffered loss during this time that you would bring them whole. You would restore them. Lord, help us to be a blessing to those who are suffering, um, even, even in our own church family. Father, we thank you that we're able to gather together to, to sing praise to you, to read your word, to, to proclaim your truth. Now, Father, we ask that you would bless this time, that you would be honored and glorified, that you would be lifted up. We ask that the Holy Spirit would be at work among us, changing hearts and lives and minds. Lord, help us to be quick to turn from our sin, to trust in you. And Father, we, we pray for the church around the world, some of whom can't gather today, uh, either because of persecution or in many places around Texas because of the, the results of the weather. Uh, and in some places, perhaps because the weather is still uh, keeping people uh, locked into their homes. Uh, but Father, for those who can gather, we ask that you would encourage them together. For those who cannot, we ask that you would be with them and give them peace and comfort in a special way. Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our president, for the Congress. We pray for the leaders of our state and city. We ask that they would be wise and make wise decisions in the laws that are enacted and, and executed. We ask that you would allow us to live peaceable and quiet lives, and that we would have opportunities and with those around us to show the love of Christ and to share the truth of Christ. Again, Father, I ask for this particular uh, service, for this sermon, uh, that you would help me to proclaim your truth and you would change our hearts because of it. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the churches in Galatia. It was a region uh, in Rome, in the Roman Empire, that is, modern-day Turkey. Uh, Most likely, it was part of the area where Paul had preached on his first missionary journey. Uh, Some people there had believed Paul. They had become saved, and he had established churches with them. Uh, But in Paul's absence, in the meantime, others have come in and they've begun preaching a false gospel. Some people had begun telling the Galatians that faith was important, but equally important were the works of the law, especially circumcision, which represented the entrance into the people of God. So to be truly righteous before God, they said you need to have faith plus these works of the law. Well, Paul is countering this, defending salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. The work of Christ is sufficient, and we cannot add anything to it. The overarching theme of Paul's message is the gospel itself, Christ crucified. We're saved by faith in Christ crucified and not by our works. And then we see Two themes to prove that overarching theme. First, the Spirit proves that we're saved by faith in Christ. And second, Abraham proves that we're saved by faith in Christ. Let's look at that overarching theme first. What Paul lays it out right there in verse 1. Uh, the gospel is Christ crucified, or Christ crucified is the gospel. Verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Well, once again in Galatians, we see Paul confronting the Galatians in very strong terms. Foolish Galatians. Bewitched Galatians. In verse 3, he asks again, are they really being so foolish? In chapter 1, verse 6, Paul had expressed astonishment that they were so quickly turning away from the gospel, turning away from God who had called them to salvation. He condemned in the strongest terms anyone who would preach a different gospel. And now Paul says that the Galatians are being foolish for abandoning the true gospel. There's only one true gospel. And then Paul summarized the gospel they had abandoned, Christ crucified. So Paul begins this section by centering on the gospel itself. Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. And Paul's not saying that they did a skit where they portrayed Jesus as crucified Uh, He's not saying that he drew them a picture of Christ crucified. Not that there's anything wrong with those things. They're certainly valid uh, as appropriate illustrations in appropriate context. But what Paul is saying is he made this the focal point of his public message. Jesus Christ is crucified. Christ crucified is the gospel. Christ crucified was the gospel message message that the apostles proclaimed. Uh, On Pentecost, when the crowd gathered to see what was going on, Peter preached uh, the sermon, and the center of his message is in Acts 2, verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Christ crucified. Uh, Christ crucified was Paul's consistent message. 1 Corinthians 2, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Colossians 1, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether in heaven or in earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. And just a little later from our passage in Galatians 6, but far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ crucified is the gospel. Now, we may say that's a pretty short summary of the gospel. Yeah, sure, it's a very short summary of the gospel. Uh, We do not mean that Paul went around and the only two words he said were Christ crucified. Paul, tell us your message, Christ crucified. What do you mean by that? Christ crucified. Any more details? Christ crucified. 
Uh, no, uh, Paul shared a full gospel, but this is the center of the gospel message. Christ crucified is what accomplished God's eternal purpose and plan. All right, so th- this is the gospel. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life of righteousness, and then he died on the cross as a sacrifice for sin. Jesus died on the cross as a substitute for sinners. On the cross, God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. On the cross, Jesus redeemed a people for God. On the cross, Jesus conquered sin and death and Satan. On the cross, Jesus fulfilled the promises of God. All the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. So there is no good news apart from the cross of Christ. Jesus fully satisfied God in every way on the cross. And this is why all that's required of us is faith in Christ, because on the cross, Jesus satisfied God. There is nothing that is left that is required for us to do except to trust in Christ. The cross of Christ is the gospel. You know, most of us have had to take tests at one time or another. Imagine a test you were not prepared for, a test you did not study for, a test you did not know the material for. And after the test is over, you know you failed. And then you get the grade back and it confirms that in fact you failed. On a scale of 1 to 100, you scored a negative 10. Well, you know what this means for your overall grade in the class. You're going to fail. There's no mathematical way you can pass. But then the best student in the class offers to trade grades with you. He says, I'll give you my score, which was 150, and you can take, and I'll take your score. That's what Christ did. He took the punishment that we deserve, what we earned on himself, and He gave us the perfect righteousness that belonged to him. That's why the cross of Christ is the gospel. This is what we always have to come back to, the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is the beginning, the middle, and the end. To know, to grow, to change what we need is the gospel. What we need is Christ crucified. And Paul sets that reality before us first because he's going to make this distinction between the cross of Christ and works of the flesh. To be righteous before God, there is either faith in the cross of Christ or there are works that must be done. And they're two opposing ways of thinking about righteousness. Trust in the cross of Christ or trust in your own works. These two options are at odds with each other because any attempt to be saved by works is an assertion that the cross of Christ is not sufficient. If I have to work to be righteous, then the cross of Christ was not enough. And so Paul will make clear that only one path saves. You are only saved by trusting in Christ. You're only saved by trusting in Christ crucified. You cannot work to save yourself. You cannot add to the righteousness of Christ. You cannot be righteous before God based on anything that you do. Your only hope is to trust in Christ crucified. Well, the Galatians are at risk of turning from the truth. They're considering pursuing a righteousness that is based on on works. They're considering adding works to trust in Christ. And so Paul gives them two proofs that we're saved solely by faith in Christ. First, the Holy Spirit in them proves to them they were saved by faith in Christ. Second, Abraham proves that they're saved by faith in Christ. So the Spirit in them and the testimony of Abraham prove that we are saved by faith, that people are only saved by faith and not by works of the law. So first key theme in our text, the Spirit proves we are saved by faith in Christ. The Holy Spirit living in us proves that we are saved by faith in Christ. So look at verse 2. Let me ask you only this. 
Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things, if indeed it was in vain? Uh, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So first, Paul asked the questions, did you receive the Spirit by works or by faith? How did it happen? How did you receive the Spirit? Was it works or faith? Well, just a little context. I mentioned earlier, Galatians was likely written to the churches that were established in Paul's first missionary journey in southern Galatia. In that region, the people are mostly Gentiles. Uh, They're not Jewish, so they had not been circumcised. Uh, At least they wouldn't have been until this issue came up, and now some of them are thinking about being circumcised. They had not followed the law in their life before this point. Uh, Paul came, he preached the gospel to them, he proclaimed Christ crucified to them, and what did they do? They believed. They believed the gospel, they trusted in Christ crucified, and then what happened next? What happened next is that they received the Holy Spirit. They received the Spirit of God. Prior to doing any works, prior to being circumcised, uh, without anything changing, except that they believed. They believed the gospel, they believed in Christ crucified for them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So that's the answer to Paul's question. They received the Spirit by faith. Well, why does Paul focus on receiving the Spirit? Why why is he choosing the Spirit as the thing to identify their salvation? Well, the reason that Paul's focusing on the Spirit is because that is the new covenant promise. We see new covenant promises throughout the Old Testament, especially in the prophets. Uh, For the sake of time, we're just going to do one example. This is from Ezekiel chapter 36. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God promised to put his spirit in his people. I will put my spirit within you. Now, this promise was made to Israel, was made to the children of Abraham. But what we find in the New Testament is that this promise was truly made to everyone who trusts in Christ Jesus. Uh, Acts 10 is the first time that the apostles really began to understand this. I'd like us to turn together there, if you would, Acts 10. If you're using a church Bible, page 918. Uh, Acts is a little bit before Galatians. You have Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians. So back, I think that was four books, five books. As the chapter begins, an angel of God tells Cornelius to call for Simon Peter. Cornelius is a Gentile. The next day, the Lord gives Peter a vision, telling him not to consider anything unclean that God has made clean. And right as Peter's having that vision, Cornelius' messenger shows up. And Peter goes with them to meet Cornelius and his family. And in Acts 10, verse 34, we find Peter's message to these Gentiles. Verse 34, Acts 10, 34. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. 
To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So Peter, having just had this vision, begins by acknowledging that God shows no partiality based on nationality, no partiality based on ethnicity. God proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. In verses 39 through 41, we see Christ crucified and risen from the dead, central message of the gospel. And then in verse 43, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins. All the prophets bear witness to Jesus. Everyone who believes in Jesus will be forgiven of sin. So Peter proclaimed salvation by faith alone in Christ alone to these Gentiles. And then look in verse 44 at what happened. While Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter declared, verse 47, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and asked him to remain for some days. So these Gentiles received the Holy Spirit and the Jewish Christians were all shocked. This was a, it wasn't supposed to be a new revelation to them, but it was in fact a new revelation to them. The Holy Spirit was poured out even on Gentiles. They didn't have to be circumcised first. They didn't have to fulfill the law. They simply believed in Jesus and they received the Holy Spirit. So the new covenant promise of Holy Spirit by faith for Jews and Gentiles. We're coming back to Galatians. Paul is reminding the Galatians of what they had experienced. From their own experience, they knew that they had received the Holy Spirit when they believed. They knew their salvation began at the moment they believed, not some other time, some later time based on works. Those of the circumcision party They were arguing that to really be in the family of God, you had to be circumcised. You had to obey the law. But the Galatians knew from their own personal experience, they had received the Holy Spirit by faith and not by works. So you could argue about many things, but you couldn't argue about when they received the Spirit. They received the Spirit by faith and not by works. Well, if you're not already back in Galatians, turn back to Galatians 3 in verse Three, Paul builds on this principle that they have already received the Spirit by faith. Uh, essentially, he says, you began through the Spirit, but now will you be perfected by the flesh? So they, they know they begin by the Spirit. Paul's already reminded them of that. And now Paul's going to contrast the Spirit with the flesh. They began by the Spirit, whom they received by faith. And now are they going to be perfected by the flesh, by the works they do? So Paul's at this point, for this section of his argument, he's actually moving beyond the argument of the circumcision party. They were arguing that you needed circumcision to even really be saved, to really enter the family of God. And Paul's saying, we already established how you're saved. You received the Spirit by faith. Let's talk about how you are sanctified, how you grow. If you were saved by faith, are you now instead perfected by your works? So you began by the Spirit, but now you want to pursue works to be perfected? It doesn't make sense. You don't start by the Spirit, by faith, and then suddenly switch to finish thing, finishing off by the works of the flesh. Let me give you an illustration. In football, uh, maybe many sports, but especially football, you often have a team with a really aggressive defense, and they just shut the other team down. Uh, They're after the quarterback, they're blocking the receivers, they don't give the running back any room, and they just dominate the entire game. And so the the team builds a lead, but then you get towards the end of the game, and all of a sudden, they don't want to let the other team get a big play. And so rather than doing what's been working all game, they go to what's called a prevent defense. And so they start to back off a little bit, and countless times what happens is suddenly the offense on the other team starts picking them apart, 
and they go down the field and score because the defense thinks they need to do something different now than what they did all along. They think they need to change in order to finish the job. And in the same way, Christians often think we're saved by faith, but now that we're saved, we need to do something different to finish. We were saved by faith then, but now we work for righteousness. Now we work to be completed in our faith. So we're saved by faith, but now we're going to work to complete our faith. And the reality is we're saved by faith and we grow by faith. It's very similar to the desire to save yourself in the first place. You think you can work to please God prior to salvation, but then you recognize, no, I'm saved by faith, so you trusted Christ. But now that you're saved by faith, you want to try and go and do works. Paul's saying, no, you can't, be, you can't satisfy God by your works. We were saved by faith and we grow by faith. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking of all the examples of Scripture that call us to act, to do things, to put sin to death, to put off the old self, to live in the good works that God has prepared before, beforehand for us, right? Things we're commanded to do. But the issue is not whether we should do things. The issue is how do we do things? And it is not fundamentally by works of the flesh, but by faith. We're not we are not relying on our works or resting in our works. We're relying on Christ. We're resting in Christ. So we do good works, not in the hope that our actions will improve our standing, but simply because we want to please God. We do good works by faith in Christ. Philippians 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for... It is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We work out our salvation because God is at work in us. We do not work out our salvation so that God will work in us. God is at work in us, and so by faith we do good works. We look to God who is at work in us and not to ourselves. And this is really important, and it's really freeing. There's this temptation to believe we're saved by faith, but now we'll be perfected by works. I was saved by faith, but now I'm going to grow by what I do. And in fact, many Christians feel not only that they can grow by their works, but that they must grow by their works. As if Christ was responsible for my salvation, but I am responsible for my growth. We do not grow because of what we do, but because of what Christ has done. As we saw in chapter 2, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Everything I do, I do by faith in the Son of God. I'm not resting in my works, but in the work of Christ for me. So I do not read the Bible to earn favor with God. I don't love my neighbor to earn favor with God. I don't give away all that I have to earn favor with God. I read the Bible, I love my neighbor, I give generously because Christ has granted me favor with God by faith, because I love him. I never again have to pursue favor with God or growth in grace by works, because God is infinitely satisfied in the work of Christ on the cross. So we are not perfected by works. Paul continues with another question. Did you suffer in vain? Did you suffer so many things in vain? Uh, They'd clearly suffered for their faith, and Paul's asking them, was that suffering in vain? Well, what would make their suffering vain? If they suffered the consequences of being a Christian, but they weren't really a Christian, then they would have suffered in vain. Right? Why suffer for being a Christian if you're not really a Christian? You might as well go ahead and be honest that you're not a Christian and avoid the suffering entirely. Right? Why suffer so many things if it was all for nothing? Go ahead and acknowledge you don't really believe you're saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, and avoid the suffering entirely. Now, I think it's obvious Paul is not attempting to get, a, get them to say that their suffering was in vain. 
Uh, He is trying to remind them that their suffering was for their faith, that their suffering was real because their faith was real. That suffering was because they really belonged to Christ and Christ considered them worthy to suffer for his name. So Paul is again appealing to their own experience. They suffered because of their faith. So why are you acting like that suffering was irrelevant? Perhaps you've suffered for your faith. Maybe you've been mocked or mistreated. Maybe you've been rejected or scorned. If you later abandon the faith you once claimed, that suffering would have been in vain. And Paul's reminding them, they suffered for the truth, so hold fast to the truth now. Don't abandon the truth now. Last question, verse 5. The question is essentially, did God provide the Spirit or miracles by works or by faith? So Paul's working along the same line, but he asks a different question. How does God provide the Spirit? How does God provide miracles? Does he do it because you do works and then God responds to those works? No. No, God didn't give the Spirit by works of the law. If God did give the Spirit by works of the law, there would be no need for Christ. But God gave the Spirit by faith in Christ. Did miracles happen among them by works? Uh, no, was the answer Paul is looking for. They, they know that the miracles did not happen by works. And if you look at all the miracles recorded in the New Testament, not one of them was based on works. They're based on faith. Same with the Old Testament. So whatever miracles had been done among the Galatians were clearly accomplished by faith and not by works. So God gave them the Spirit. God gave them miracles by faith. So we're not saved or perfected by works of the law. We're saved by faith. We're given the Spirit by faith. The Spirit proves that we're saved by faith in Christ. Second key theme, Abraham proves we're saved by faith in Christ. Abraham proves we're saved by faith in Christ. Now look at verse 6. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, Abraham is universally considered to be the father of the people of God. To be a child of Abraham is to be a child of promise. To be a child of Abraham is to belong to the people of God. To be a child of Abraham means God is your God and you are God's child. And that brings up the question, though, who is a true child of Abraham? What makes one a true child of Abraham? And the natural thought is, well, we know what makes someone a son or a daughter. If he's your biological father or great-grandfather or distant ancestor, you're his son. And the Jews certainly believed that. They knew they were descended from Abraham. They were Abraham's children. And that is true in the biological sense. It's also true in the community sense. Uh, Paul noted just in the last section that he and Peter were Jews by birth. He's saying we're children of Abraham. They have this heritage in the covenant community. But is being descended from Abraham what makes one a true child of Abraham? And Paul's answer, God's answer, is no. Being descended from Abraham does not guarantee that you are a true child of Abraham. Biological children in in the normal world can choose to alienate themselves from their family. They can choose to leave their family. And many of Abraham's descendants have chosen not to be his true children. Well, what then does make a person a true child of Abraham? The children of Abraham are those who follow his line. Not a biological line, but a line of faith. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So Abraham's works did not make him righteous. Abraham trusted God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Verse 7, therefore... 
we know that it is those of faith who are the true sons of Abraham. Those of faith are the ones who are counted as true sons or daughters of Abraham. Because those of faith are the ones who truly follow the line of Abraham. What is significant about Abraham is not his genetic line, but his genuine faith. And if you want to be a child of Abraham, you can join him by faith. This comes back to what we saw in the very beginning. The gospel is Christ crucified. You must believe that Jesus died for sin, that Jesus died for you. You must acknowledge he's Lord of all. Believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, victorious over sin and death. And you will be a child of Abraham, a child of God. In John 1, the apostle John is previewing the message he's going to share in the rest of the book. And he says in verse 11, Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Jesus' own people did not receive him. Many of the children of Abraham rejected Jesus, because they were not true children of Abraham. But to those who did receive Jesus, those who believed in his name, they received the right to be called children of God. Not by blood, not because of their family, not by the will of the flesh or the will of man, not by their own will, but by God who saved them. So who are the true children of Abraham? Those who believe like Abraham. Now, this does leave the question of exactly what Abraham believed. I mean, Abraham certainly didn't know specifically about Jesus. He didn't know the name Jesus. But Abraham knew the gospel. He didn't know every detail that's been revealed to us today. But he knew enough to believe, and he did believe, and it was counted to him as righteousness. God revealed himself in his promises to Abraham. God revealed he would bless the world through Abraham's offspring. The offspring in the fullness of time became known as Jesus. And Abraham believed the promises of God. He believed the revelation given to him, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham believed the gospel, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And if you believe the gospel, then you too will be counted righteous like Abraham. Those who are of faith are the true sons of Abraham. And Paul makes clear in the next verse, verse 8, that this was God's purpose all along. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. Scripture is personified here. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. To say that differently, God always intended to justify the Gentiles by faith. And so he proclaimed that to Abraham and it was recorded in Scripture. God told Abraham, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That promise to Abraham was to him and to his offspring. But the blessing was not only to his physical offspring, all nations would be blessed through him. And all nations have been blessed through him. Right? All nations are blessed through Abraham, the man of faith. Verse 9, those who believe are blessed with Abraham because of his faith. Verse 9, so then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So who are the ones who are blessed with Abraham? Is it his physical offspring? Are they the ones blessed the same as Abraham? Well, no, according to verse 9, it is those who are of faith who are blessed along with Abraham. This is really the second time in just a few verses Paul has highlighted this exact reality. Those of faith are blessed with Abraham. Those of faith are the true children of Abraham. And if you would like to be counted righteous like Abraham, you must have faith like Abraham. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's no other salvation. There's no other way to be reconciled to God 
You cannot please God on your own. You cannot work your way to satisfying God's demands. There's only one way to be reconciled to God. There's only one way for your sin to be covered. Jesus is the Lord of all who lived the righteous life that God demands and then died as a sacrifice for sinners. He died in the place of sinners. And you can't add anything to what Christ has accomplished. The only thing you can do is turn from your sin and trust in God's Son. You know, if you're here today because your parents brought you here, uh, you're receiving a great blessing. It is a blessing to be in a house that loves God, where the gospel is taught, that goes to a church where Jesus is proclaimed. These are blessings from God, but they are not the ultimate blessing. Being a child of someone who loves God does not mean that you love God. Being a child of parents who are in the family of God does not mean that you are in the family of God. If you want to be in the family of God, you must join by faith. Just like Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. The new covenant promise was the promise that God would put his own spirit within his people. And the spirit is received by faith, not by works. God's revelation to Abraham was received by faith, not by works. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Jesus Christ has satisfied God on the cross. Christ crucified is the gospel. May we believe these things and may we find rest in the complete work of Christ. Let's pray to him. God, our Father, we praise you that in your love and kindness, you sent your Son to earth for us. Jesus, we praise you that you're worthy. You're the Lamb who is worthy to be slain before the foundation of the world. You lived in perfect righteousness, that you died for sinners like us. We ask that the Spirit would be at work among us. We praise you. That through the new covenant in Jesus' blood, you have come for us to give us life and faith, to grant us a desire to please you. Father, we ask that you would send your spirit to save, that those who do not know you would turn from their sin and trust in your son. And may we be bold to proclaim this truth. In Jesus' name, amen.